Black and they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Pleasure, thank you for Grace Fund and Blue Lord getting us off to such a good start. The battle belongs to the Lord. Today we celebrate the festival of the Reformation. But we look back in time to see how God restored the truth of Scripture through his servant, Martin Luther. But really our purpose is not to praise him. It is to praise God for his word that was restored. The word that points out our sin, the word of God that shows us our Savior, and the word of God that gives us certainty with all the promises of God. We are all yes in Christ Jesus, especially the promise of a life to come in heaven. May God bless our time together today around his word. Our opening hymn, Our Mighty Fortress. <laughs>
created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In how this ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sins and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ he has removed your guilt forever you are his own dear child may God give you strength to live according to his will Amen. in the peace of forgiveness let us praise the Lord <laughs>
28. So we have the doctrine of justification by faith explained clearly to us by the Apostle Paul. You say the church will stand or fall on this doctrine, the doctrine, the teaching of justification by faith, that our only hope for eternal life is in heaven is through Christ, through faith in Christ and what he has done, not on the basis of anything that we do, think, or say. So this doctrine is clearly explained here to us by the Apostle Paul. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, which the law of the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ, in Jesus Christ, to all who believe. There is no difference for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? He is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No. But on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith, apart from observing the law. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. Please stand.
are yours in Jesus, your Lord, Redeemer, and Savior, the one who has given us his word to guide us, bless us, and save us. Amen. The word of God we consider on this festival of the Reformation, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. In the name of our dear Savior Christ Jesus, who has loved you with an everlasting love, a love that will eventually receive you into the mansions of glory in heaven. Fellow Redeemer. Every halftime, the pep band played the Beach Boys song, Barbara Ann. Team loved it. The fans loved it. Everyone in the gymnasium started singing and clapping along. Music certainly has a lot of power and can get people interested and delegated, relegated to serving the Lord in many different ways. Sometimes it's a song like the theme song of the Olympics, the national anthem, a school song. A beautiful song can turn a disinterested person into a very interested listener and singer. Music has its power. What's your favorite song? Why is it your favorite song? Well, I'm sure you have your reasons. But I'd like to suggest today a song for you that you would put toward the top of your list of favorites. This song was at the top of the charts nearly 500 years ago, and it is still treasured by millions of Christians today. Song? We sang it a few minutes ago. A mighty fortress is our God. Well, let's focus on that today in the Festival of the Reformation. A mighty fortress is our God. This was Israel's comfort in the day of trouble. This was Luther's confidence in the face of danger. And this must be our certainty in times of distress. The words of this song were written by Martin Luther. He based the words of this, of this hymn on Psalm 46. One of the most beautiful of the 150 psalms. It is beautiful because of the comforting truths that it offers to believers like you and like me. How many people believe that Psalm 46 was written as a result of a great victory that the Lord had brought about for his king, King Hezekiah, who ruled over the southern kingdom of Judah? Now, in his own right, King Hezekiah was a great reformer. Because of his works and his efforts, blessed by God, a great reformation took place in Judah. Now, during the reign of Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, heathen altars had been built. Shrines had been dedicated, dedicated to pagan deities. Temple worship in Jerusalem had been shut down. But unlike his father, the Bible says, King Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He destroyed the pagan altars, tore to pieces the temple shrines, pillars dedicated to pagan deities. He even broke that serpent, broke to pieces that serpent that Moses had built, broke it into pieces because God's people had turned it into an object of worship. Hezekiah restored the sacrifices. He restored the worship services at the temple. It was indeed a great Reformation. But Hezekiah was a man who had his days and doubts and fears and questioning God and God's ways. When the Assyrian king, a man by the name of Sennacherib, invaded Judah, he seized all of the fortified cities of Judah that filled Hezekiah with fear. But instead of turning to the Lord for help against this Assyrian king, 
Hezekiah tried to buy him off with money. If he accepts the money, he'll get out of the country and we'll be all right. But it didn't work. Temple treasury was depleted. And Sennacherib, he didn't leave Judah. He marched his armies right up the, to the city walls and prepared for battle. Can you imagine how that made the Israelites feel and how it made Hezekiah feel? But now he did the right thing, which he should have done at the beginning. He turned to the Lord for help. He recognized that God was his refuge and his strength and ever-present help in trouble. That same night, God sent an angel to the enemy camp, and that angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. It was a magnificent display of the power of God who will not be intimidated or despised by any enemy. Can you imagine feelings of gratitude that must have filled the hearts of the Israelites when they woke up the next morning, looked across the enemy fields, and saw nothing but dead bodies? What a great deliverance God had brought about. On the day before, their whole world was collapsing around them, and then the next day, there was a great deliverance. I don't know what song the children of Israel say upon that great miracle, but I'm sure it must have resembled Luther's song. A mighty fortress is our God. That was Israel's comfort in the day of trouble. A mighty fortress is our God. That was Luther's confidence in the face of danger. Now, how do we begin? to describe the danger, the turmoil, the trouble that Luther experienced at the time of the Reformation. Just think of the inner turmoil, the inner anxieties of his heart and his mind. It was no easy task for Luther to part company with the church that had raised him and instructed him. How would you like to call the traitor, traitor, for the very church that you grew up with? How would you feel about getting a letter from the church that in essence condemned you to hell because of your leaving the church? <coughs> How would you feel about being excommunicated from the church and declared a heretic that is one who was in league with the devil? That inner turmoil must have been Overwhelming. How many times must Luther have asked himself, I wonder if I'm really doing the right thing? So where did he flee for help? Where did he go for strength? He tells us in his song, a mighty fortress is our God. Luther knew well the words of Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. But there was more than inner problems and struggles that Luther had to deal with. There were struggles on the outside. The German Emperor, Charles V, he wanted to bring the Reformation to a close because he wanted to unify his country against the Turks who were knocking at the door of Eastern Europe. There were problems with the Peasants' War. Many people blame Luther for the Peasants' War. And there were theologians, like Calvin, Swingley, who were denying clear teachings of the Bible concerning the Lord's Supper. And many people were being deceived. It's almost too much for one person to deal with and think about and try to handle. And it was. That's why he tells us, a mighty fortress is our God. In that battle hymn of the Reformation, Luther makes this confession. With might of ours can not be done, can nothing be done. Soon were a loss effected. The forest fights the valiant one whom God himself elected. Ask ye, who is this? Jesus Christ it is, of Sabbath Lord, 
and there is no other God. He holds the field forever. Isn't it ironic that for so many years Luther never saw God as a mighty fortress? For so many years Luther saw God as someone to be feared. You see, from childhood, he was taught by his church that good works and good deeds need to be done in order to appease God. In order to gain God's favor, you need to do that before you have any hope of ever entering heaven. Well, the more works Luther did, the harder he tried, the more guilt he became because he knew he was falling short. And yet he, these commands were demanded by the church. The more he worked and the harder he worked at it, the more guilt-ridden he became, and the further away God seemed to be. Instead of wanting to get to God, Luther wanted to run away from God, because he feared God as an angry judge who would one day condemn him to hell. But it was only by a miracle of God's grace that Luther's eyes were opened to see the truth. The truth is God has revealed it, revealed it to us through the Holy Scriptures. From God's book, the Bible, Luther learned that there is no way, shape, or form that anyone can gain God's favor to enter heaven. It can't be done because all of sin, all fall short of the glory of God. From that book, Luther learned that the only hope was through faith in Jesus. He believed the words that Paul wrote in the book of Romans. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Only then did God become for Luther a mighty fortress. Not one to be feared, but to be loved, to be trusted, to be followed. Luther's been dead for centuries. But I think I know what song. He's saying, never. A mighty fortress is our God. He sings that because he knows the words of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. This was Luther's confidence in the face of danger. And this must be your certainty of mind. In times of distress, we live in a different part of the world in a different kind of world. How amazed Luther would be if he could suddenly appear today and see all of the changes that have taken place from his day on this earth. How amazed Luther would be to see copy machines and computers instead of the Gutenberg press that was invented a few years before his birth. How amazed he would be to see all of the changes yet Luther would be one of the first to tell us that there are some things that do not change. The enemies of Christ, and therefore the enemies of the Christian, never change. One of those enemies is Satan. Satan is as real as ever. He is that roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan has one goal and one purpose, to populate hell. He wants you with him in hell. But he can't help you. He can't help you. As long as God remains your refuge and your strength, he can't have you. As long as you keep singing in word or with your heart, a mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And he did that at Calvary's cross. And he permits us, permits us by faith to share in that victory. You and I are victorious over the devil because of Christ Jesus. Another enemy in the world. Uh, the world, another enemy is the world and the people of this world. How you and I need to hear Jesus say to us again and again, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world sings a different song than Luther sang. Do you recognize the lyrics? They go like this. Don't take your religion so seriously. Be open-minded enough to believe that God will save anyone who is sincere in what they believe. It doesn't really matter what they believe, but as long as they are sincere in what they believe. You hear the lyrics? They go something like this. You need to look out for yourself because nobody else is going to look out for you. It's a dog-eat-dog world. something like this. Don't talk to me about religion. You do your thing, I'll do mine. Besides, who knows what's truth and what isn't truth? And who made you judge and jury anyway? Oh, listen to the lyrics of the world and you will recognize them for what they are. Expressions of sin, expressions of unbelief. Like King Hezekiah, like Luther, you and I, we have our days, we have our moments, we have our hours, when we are troubled about our relationship with God, troubled about the promises that He makes, troubled between ourselves and God that bother us. There are going to be days when we question the very value of life, when we question the meaning of life. There are days that are going to come that come into our lives and we would just as soon throw in the towel and join the world that led loose instead of remaining committed to following Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord. Dear friends, in God and in God alone is the meaning of our life. In God and in God alone. We find a purpose for our existence. He provides us with the meaning for our life, with a purpose for existence. He provides us with the answers to sin, to death, and the hereafter. There are going to be days when you say, or I say, who really cares anyway? Does anybody really care? Dear friends, God cares. Here. Look at the cross. Look at those outstretched arms of your Savior, bleeding and dying because of his great love for you. He was determined to die so that you might live, that you might have complete and full pardon for all of your sins. That's how much God loves you. Who cares? God cares. Tremendous. We can't even begin to fathom the love that God has for you in Christ Jesus. Never cease marveling about that love. Because it's yours by faith in Christ Jesus. Who cares? God cares. What's your favorite song? <coughs> Again, let me suggest to you that you consider putting this song, Mighty Fortress, toward the top of your list of favorites. Whether you can sing or not, it brings great joy. And this hymn expresses truths that can help you, help me, every day of our life. And the reason is because they're based on Scripture. God is a refuge of strength and ever-present help in trouble. Or in the words of Luther, a mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. May God keep you and keep me in that saving faith until he calls us to our permanent home in heaven. Amen. Please stand. <laughs> Let us now join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will 
eternal God, when the time had fully come, you sent your Son to take our place under the demands of the law and to endure the just punishment for our sins. For our sake, you accepted his sacrifice on the cross and raised him from death to glorious splendor. When the time had fully come, you bestowed your Holy Spirit on your people as a testimony that you had called them to proclaim the gospel to every creature, be equipped and encouraged to carry the word of salvation into all the world. When the time had fully come, you raised up your servant, Martin Luther, to restore the pure and right teaching of the scriptures to a troubled church. You renewed your people with the light of your love, and your holy church grew and prospered throughout the world. When the time had fully come, you made our forefathers bold to take their stand on the truth of your word. You have blessed their sons and daughters, and have enabled us to preserve and proclaim the saving gospel. Let this be a time, O oh Lord, when you renew us again, by word and by sacrament, when you reform our hearts and minds, and when you restore to us the joy of fellowship and service, grant to us in this age and in this place the courage of the apostles, the steadfastness of the reformers, and the dedication of those who have fallen before us. May this be a time, O oh Lord, for confession and repentance. Forgive us for the apathy that arms our faith and hinders our works. Forgive us for boasting of our past achievements and for blaming others for our present problems. Rid us of indifference to public worship and Bible study. Destroy the distrust that plagues us and shatter every thought and word that harms the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Let this be a time, O Lord, when we recommit and we consecrate ourselves to the ministry of the gospel. Let us find joy in our unity, zeal for our work, and success in our labor. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the next year.